Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Vinoy. I am currently the chair of the CE department. And I hope that you all had a, you know, very good conference uh, experience in the last few days. Uh, three days ago, we were uh, celebrating the 75th anniversary of the department and uh, uh, Dr. Kumar Sivrajan was giving a talk on the future of uh, communications and future of ECE. And at that point of time, someone asked this question, where does, you know, free space optics fit in? And uh, today we have a plenary talk on this topic by uh, Professor Muhammad uh, Slay Maloney, who happens to have the same PhD supervisor as the general chair of this conference, uh, Professor Milesh. Meta. So after his uh, PhD from Caltech, he has moved on to uh, University of Minnesota and then to Texas and m and uh, also to uh, the uh, Texas and m at Qatar. And then he uh, is currently a distinguished professor at King Abdullah. Uh, University of Science and Technology, JST in Saudi Arabia. So he is a fellow of IEEE and uh, the Optical Society of America, uh, which is now called uh, Optica. So we are fortunate to have him here because he work on uh, areas which, in 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 my uh, own ways, if I may say it, you know, which connects the communications uh, theory with. Some of the hardware things that we, some of us in the department, work on, and uh, I happily invite him for giving this uh, plenary talk here. And the talk will be for uh, one hour, and after that, we'll also have an industry session uh, today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, it's truly my pleasure uh, to be here in front of you. Uh, throughout my career, I mean, since I was a student, I had a lot of interesting uh, interaction with uh, brilliant uh, Indian students initially, and then uh, collaborators and colleagues, including uh, Professor Nilash Mehta, as mentioned. So it's uh, really my pleasure and honor to be standing here in front of you in uh, one of the main engines behind uh, uh, I would say uh, the academic success of India, the Indian Institute of Science here in Bangalore. So uh, thank you again for the organizer for inviting me and uh, for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity uh, to share with you some of our uh, recent interest in uh, this connection or potential connection, let's say, between optical wireless communication and uh, this topic that is uh, quite a bit of interest these days uh, which is about connecting the unconnected. So uh, this is kind of the theme of today's talk. So uh, as we know, uh, worldwide, uh, we are aggressively deploying 5G. And those of you active in wireless communication know very well that we work on a 10-year cycle. As 5G is being deployed worldwide, there's quite a bit of brainstorming going on about the vision for beyond 5G or 6G that is expected to be deployed, let's say, in the early 2030s. And obviously, most of the work, or most of the interest when we start talking about beyond 5G and 6G, is about these Olympic records, or let's say this kind of pushing the envelope type of metrics. How can we get higher capacity? How can we connect more devices? How can we get lower latency? And, uh, you know, of course, this is a very interesting, and myself, and including many, I'm sure in this room, are quite active in this particular topic. But I think we need to remember that we are still living in a world where roughly or nearly half of our population is still, say, unconnected or underconnected. By underconnected, I mean they are still living with a 2G type of connections. The reasons are many. I'm going to skip here all the social and kind of uh, literacy type of reason behind this digital divide. But uh, let's kind of talk about two of the main reasons. One of them is that it doesn't make 
much business sense for many of the mobile network operators to kind of, uh, let's say, dig and uh, uh, install hundreds if not thousands of kilometers of fiber optics to reach very sparsely populated, typically poor rural areas. So that's one of the main reasons. The second reason, which is an obvious one, is that obviously uh, to get a good wireless network, you need to have an underlying good electric uh, power grid. And in many developing countries, uh, often uh, 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 these kind of power grid are either not there or if they are there, not, they are not very reliable. So I would say these are two of the main technical reasons behind the fact that we still suffer from this technical, from this kind of digital divide that is illustrated in this kind of map in front of you. So obviously, uh, and I think the pandemic showed that uh, obviously one can say that this uh, connectivity divide is in a way the modern face of inequality between the have and have not in a digital context. And uh, bridging this connectivity divide, trying to break that uh, vicious uh, uh, cycle that I'm showing in the slide can help prosper many of these areas by providing better remote education uh, to, to, to these communities, better health services, more, I would say, financial opportunities to, like, basically, let's say, farmers and, and so on. So there is this kind of interesting uh, uh, connection uh, between connectivity and between the prosperity of some of these regions and, and how we can basically, by connecting these and connected, improve the quality of life of many of these uh, remote and rural regions, or I would say even low-income neighborhoods within uh, urban areas. But beyond that, uh, I would like to emphasize that connected and connected is not only about uh, trying to help people who are already unconnected, it can actually trigger some other interesting phenomena. So if many of us who maybe are living now in a very well connected areas can enjoy living in, let's say, more rural type of areas, maybe remote from urban area, but still enjoy full connectivity, we may not have to uh, move from our rural environment, if you are living in rural environment, or basically can maybe motivate people to move from congested, polluted, so-called smart cities, because we are trying to make them more efficient, to, you know, more relaxed and more uh, kind of, uh, uh, or less crowded, let's say, uh, uh, rural areas. So we can talk beyond just a smart city concept to something much broader. Once we have connectivity uh, in place, everywhere, we can start talking about smart hamlets, smart villages, and more generally about smart living. So in a way, to me, this is another motivation behind this work because it can trigger what we can say a counter urbanization process that can uh, avoid this uh, migration to this so many mega cities that all the reports are predicting uh, uh, in the future. So this is just to put the work in, a, in its context. And, and by the way, Today's talk is not meant to be very technical. I will have a few equations here and there, just to kind of, uh, uh, let's say, tease those of you who, who like your performance nice type of problem. But I'll try to, to stay at a high level, so hopefully everyone benefits. So that was kind of a general introduction, just to put things in the right context. But let's now look at uh, some of the challenges and maybe potential solutions. So one challenge uh, that I mentioned earlier can be summarized in this kind of a, a, a graph. So here we are looking at the quality of experience and the quality of experience can, can be in terms of data rate, latency, and so on, as function of the cost per user in particular in the remote low population density areas. Now, if you focus on this part of the diagram, obviously this is going to give you the right performance, but it's going to be very expensive. That's not the way to go. Traditional satellite communication system, typically broadcast TV, type of systems are good for one-way broadcasting, but have not been designed for two-way internet browsing. So they will be low cost, relatively speaking, but they will not give you the right quality from an internet browsing. So what we are after, actually, when you, when you, when you are about connecting this and connected in this remote area, this, what we can call the holy grail of uh, uh, global connectivity, is to try to get a good quality of experience at a low cost in order to fulfill this uh, prophetic, let's say, or visionary statement made by Tesla 100 years ago. If you, if you read that statement, it's like a 5G or 6G statement made in 1919, okay? So how can we do that? 
And, and that's one thing when I start looking at these kind of problems, like maybe five years ago or so, is kind of really the opposite way we think about designing the wireless cellular systems in an urban dense environment. You know, the first thing we learn when we take uh, our class in uh, you know, cellular communication, wireless communication, is densify. Go for small cell, right? Why you want to go for small cell? You want to reuse the spectrum more efficiently. You want to connect as many units as possible within these small areas. Actually, when you start about rural areas, that's the reverse way you should do. You should go for very broad cells. The bigger the cell is, the better it is. Because the density population is low, you want to have one single tower that cover as much as possible. And one way to do that is basically to reuse the TV infrastructure. Why? The TV infrastructure typically is designed you know, in strategic location in rural areas. You can take advantage of the TV white space. It's not very popular in India, but now in the US, for example, South Africa, this is a technology that kind of proved that has been very interesting to connect you know, tens of kilometers of radius using this kind of a beachfront type of spectrum. Why is beachfront? It's the VHF, UHF, it gives you very long range propagations. And that's a way to create your macro cell in order to connect more people within that coverage area. Now, if you want to go broader in terms of coverage, you go a little bit higher. You know, at the end of the day, a mast is going to be 15, 20 meters in altitude. You want to go higher, get a, foot, a, a bigger footprint. You know, there is this kind of interesting new technology or emerging technology, so-called uh, tethered balloon or airship or aerostat, again, you know, becoming popular in the US, uh, also some Asian countries like Japan. And the idea is to have this kind of, uh, uh, you know, they, they use the buoyancy principle like helium, but they are connected with the cable. The cable can give power, can give uh, backhaul, and you can get up to, let's say, you know, 100 kilometer radius coverage with basically a base station attached to this uh, tether balloon. You want to go even higher, then you go to the stratosphere. So what is the stratosphere? Is you know, 20 kilometers from the ground. You know, just uh, for calibration purpose, our airlines, you know, airplanes, they fly at roughly 10 kilometer altitude. So here is a twice altitude of an airplane. So we have the so-called high altitude platform, known also as HAP, so for high altitude pseudo satellite. So these stay in a pseudo satellite range, which is like they're basically in a fixed location and uh, they can give you a footprint of about 200 kilometer radius. And again, the beauty of all the solutions I've been talking about here is you do not have a special need, you don't, need, you don't need special equipment. You can use your standard phone that you're using every day to connect to the close by base station to connect to a base station that is attached to a house, 20 kilometer in the air. And many experiments have been already done, 4G, even 5G, connecting regular phone to base station in the air and the coverage can be quite big again, okay? Now, the ultimate solution is to go with satellites. And uh, uh, probably those of you who are following the tech news know about this race between, uh, you know, Kuiper with Amazon and, uh, uh, you know, like uh, Starlink with, uh, uh, with uh, SpaceX. But, uh, you know, this is for Leo Mega Constellation. But if you want to look at the classical satellite communication system, we can talk about geostationary satellite, 36,000 kilometers, but they are done in a different way now. Uh, you have typically, and I will be focusing more and more on this kind of technology because I will go back to this uh, down the road. But basically, you have a satellite, you have a feeder link. So the feeder link is kind of a, uh, the kind of a way to connect the satellite to the internet, so to make the, uh, the satellite become an internet port of presence. And then typically, you kind of create a cellular system. So in other words, this is called the user link side. The user link is you reuse the spectrum, sometimes very aggressive use. And every beam can basically connect some user. Typically here, we don't have the device connected directly to the satellite. You need to have a, an earth station that can convert the signal to, uh, as a relay. And then you have like a, either a Wi-Fi access point or, a, or, or, or 5G or 6G down the road type of connectivity that would make user connect to the, to, to the satellite. So all in all, what we are talking about now is, uh, and that, that's what makes the research being done over the last years different than what happened early on, because those of you who have been in this business for some time probably have heard about this boom of satellite communication. I remember when I was a student, I don't remember Milaj, uh, there was like a big talk about Feridesic at that time and about Iridium. But, you know, uh, I mean, Iridium was, you know, not as successful as expected. Feridesic kind of went bankrupt. And the main problem there is that basically the kind of technologies went through silos. There was cellular technology going in one way and the satellite communication going in another different direction. 
And as you may recall, for example, and there are still some satellites like, like in our part of the world, Middle East, this so-called Turaya. So to connect to Turaya, you need a special phone. So you don't use the same phone that you use for your day-to-day -day life. This kind of dichotomy made the system not be very successful. The idea here, and the key word is integrating. Integrating space, satellites, air, HAPs, balloons, UAVs, and ground, terrestrial base station. This is the key aspect that is going to make beyond 5G and 6G hopefully successful and this area flourish. In other words, the end user on the ground will be using the same move, the same phone. He will basically, he will take advantage or reap up the benefit of the economy of scales. There will be no special phone to talk to a satellite. What is changing is the backbone, is how the backhaul is done. Is it done back to perhaps through relay on the ground, then going to satellite? This is what will be changed. But the ground user at the end of the day is going to use always the same phone. So now having said that, another, so that's one aspect. How, and I'm trying to put uh, you know, all the elements ready to start my technical part of the talk. So there is this kind of space slash air connectivity aspect that's going to be helpful for our problem. There is not a problem we suffer from, and it's kind of funny to, 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 to think that the problem is there, is spectrum scarcity. So maybe we may argue, yes, I understand spectrum scarcity is definitely a problem in urban area, but why is the problem in rural areas? The problem is, I mean, most of the countries, if not all, I mean, very few exceptions, the way uh, spectrum licensing works, as you know, spectrum is a natural resource, it's scarce, it's getting very competitive to get spectrum license, but then once you get the spectrum license, any mobile network operator, usually it's the kind of nationwide. So they don't give you a spectrum license only for Bombay and, uh, and let's say Bangalore. Usually it's for the whole country. And what ends up happening, although probably there's some commitment from this MNO to do good service everywhere, you know, the business nature of, the, of these uh, network operators make them do good service where they can get good money and deep type of service when they go into these rural areas where they cannot much get much income. So spectrum scarcity, all the spectrum is available, you know, it's not fully taken advantage of because you're not allowed to use it, okay, by regulations. Now, in this context, there is an interesting kind of, uh, uh, maybe, opportunity for optical wireless communication. And that's not a new opportunity, unfortunately, because, uh, again, those of you who have been active in optical wireless know that, in a way, it's becoming, by now, a mature technology. Uh, we missed the 5G train, and there is this hope that uh, optical wireless communication, and when you talk about optical wireless, you talk about infrared, you talk about visible part of the spectrum, communication, VLC or Li-Fi, and UV, which is a little bit more science fiction. But uh, basically, these technologies are at a different level of readiness, definitely infrared or free space optics and visible light. It's really uh, areas that we kind of benefit from a lot of research in the last decade. But unfortunately, they could not make it to the mass scale, or uh, they, they, we don't see them in our day-to-day -day kind of uh, standards or, or kind of 5G type of systems because of the reason I will be talking about now. But uh, definitely, uh, again, this is just for people who never come across of, uh, about optical wireless. These are some of the key advantages. Is kind of uh, the huge available and large spectrum. Uh, essentially, the, the fact that we are dealing with small equipment with very high energy efficiencies, and that you can achieve record type of data rates. You know, a lot of experiments have shown multi terabit per second capabilities with optical wireless. It is the same kind of revolution that happens few decades ago when we went from coaxial cables to fiber optics in a way guide. So it's the same thing, you know, in a way, you know, if you want to think of it at a very simple level, you know, RF will come always with its own limitation, although it's very competitive and RF people are always trying to improve and getting to better and better performance. But with optical, with the simplest technologies, you can achieve a huge and, the, the, you know, kind of a, 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 a record type of data speeds. So these are the three families of optical wireless communications that have been investigated so far. Free space optics, uh, this is the near infrared band, uh, uh, and it's typically for point-to-point -point backhaul type of applications. Then you have VLC, uh, that's in the kind of visible part of the spectrum. Uh, this is when you take advantage of LEDs in uh, indoor environment, typically to kind of be piggyback on illumination to communication. So that's not something we'll be talking about today. And there is this kind of more futuristic type of uh, uh, optical communication, which has the main characteristic of being able to communicate even in long line of sight scenario, taking 
advantage of the reflection to the atmosphere. But of course, it has many other challenges due to hardware limitations and health type of issues. So let, let me focus today on just free space optics. Okay, I mean, although VLC is a good topic, and actually, I know many colleagues here in India who are very active in this area. So free space optics, uh, you know, in, in short, I already talked about all the benefits pretty much. It's mostly for point to point, and I talked about many of the benefits. But uh, the applications are, uh, you know, typically last mile solution. You have a building, let's say, connected to the internet. You have a new building, you, you cannot dig and, and put a fiber. You just overnight can create a uh, basically fiber optic over the air type of solution with this type of transceivers. Uh, it can be a backup to the optical fiber. You have a kind of a concert, uh, 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 a final of a soccer game, uh, an Olympic type of uh, uh, event and uh, you want super high capacity for a short period of time, again, there is no point to dig and, and, and establish like this multi-terabit type of network only for two weeks. You can bring a, a terabit type of uh, fiber of the air type of network, use it during that two week period, and then dismantle the network and take it somewhere else where capacity is needed. So this is some of the spirit behind uh, optical wireless, and these are the main applications that have been discussed over the years. But the, the problem is that optical wires, and particularly at SO, comes with a, quite a bit of challenges. In particular, I would like to focus today on atmospheric turbulence, and I'll, I'll explain what it means, and alignment and tracking. So, you know, the end result is that uh, you are dealing with a fading type of uh, uh, environment or scintillating type of environment, and you need to deal with this kind of alignment type of issues. And because of that, uh, it never picked up, just to be honest, for cellular technology, you know, although it is used here and there, uh, kind of uh, uh, in an opportunistic fashion, let's say, still mobile network operator, they, 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 they feel it's not reliable enough, they want this 99.999% that they feel FSO cannot provide, and they want to have equipment that basically your kind of lambda type technician can go and install a line without having to be very sophisticated. So these two reasons made FSO being not very popular beyond the fact that, of course, there is a strong RF lobby that is always pushing for making RF technology, uh, you know, pro predominant for cellular technology. So many of these reasons made FSO, again, not very popular in the context of cellular communication so far. But there is a context where FSO can have an edge. And this is where I, I want to connect or reconnect with what I was talking about. It's when we talk about ground to space or ground to air type of backhaul. Definitely, this is an area where FSO can bring a lot of advantage. First of all, because when you talk about cellular technology, you talk about, the, you know, essentially, you want to have many of these connections. You want to put them in, in downtowns, you want to put them in different areas, and basically, as I said, RF technology is very strong there, it's very competitive, so FSO may not, find it, may, may not be the right niche for that application. But when you talk about backhaul for satellites, or backhaul for HAPS, we are talking about one device for one satellite. So it's not, it's not massive usage. But FSO can bring all its advantage. You can bring this terabit type of backhaul that is very hard to achieve with RF. So there is a niche here for FSO to be super competitive and to basically find its own niche, its own space, where it can basically outperform RF technology. So this is our typical scenario in vision. So this is the next generation of geostatic satellite communication systems. They are known as very high frequency. We are talking here about one terabit to not terabit per second uh, processing capability. So you can think of it as a base station able to process one terabit per second at any given time. Again, you have two sided satellite. You have what you call the user beam. These are beams. You can have every beam can carry like 10 gigabit per second. You can have uh, Hands, if not to handle beams, this beam can move around. They, they don't have to be always focused on a particular area. They can move where traffic is needed. They can cover maritime type of environment to connect uh, boats or, or airplanes and, and so on. So that's one side of the satellite. Satellite acting as relay, so you need the feeder link. So typically, current satellites are using KA band for feeder link. KA band is going to become very competitive in the next generation communication system for cellular technology as well as for satellites. So there was a thinking of moving K band to the user link. Now user link are typically using KU band, like lower frequencies. So K band is expected to be shared between 
ground, cellular technology or IMT to it, and the user. And that's why there is a potential to go more and more towards so-called optical feeder or FSO. So this is again not science fiction, it has been demonstrated. There are some good research done, for example, about DLR in Germany, that's the kind of German Space Agency, or NICT, the National Council of Telecommunication in Japan, two of the leaders in free space optic for space application, and they have demonstrated these terabit per second capabilities with your such receptor. Now, of course, you have to deal with the atmospheric turbulence, with the pointing, and I'll talk more about that, but also with the weather conditions. So if you have a cloud on the way that blocks your signal, that's why you need what we call side adversity. So if you have a block here, you need to have a network of optics radio stations. For example, a study was done in Europe showing that you need roughly nine optic radio stations scattered throughout Europe to be able to guarantee a 99.99% availability of your satellite fidelity. So that's one potential application. You can use the same concept for what I would call a very high throughput hubs. So a hubs can act as satellite, uh, is that the only difference is basically the footprint will be smaller. So if, if, a, if a satellite can cover one third of the Earth, a hubs can cover a radius of 200 kilometers. But again, the same concept with the maybe difference that a hubs can cover at the same time a rural and an urban environment and can have the opportunity or the advantage of using some in a dynamic way some of these beams for offloading purpose. So you have again like a, a high capacity event happening now, like a, a game or whatever, uh, a concert, you can send the beam for a couple of hours to basically help that part of the city take advantage of this extra connectivity coming from the air and some of the other beam can be allocated to all the areas, villages, uh, maritime environment and so on. So it's again the same concept and bottom line, again, you may want to rely on an optical freedom. So let's talk about a very simple uh, model, you know, for FSO. So FSO classically is about this way. So it's a flat feeding model, so it's very simple. You know, you, you, you can, you know, in the certain regime, the Gaussian noise, adding Gaussian noise to the valley, uh, you have basically this kind of uh, optical electric conversion coefficient that's known as given. And then you have the so-called channel fading, I. So I is typically the multiplication of, a, like in, 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 in classical RF wireless engineering, multiplication of many fa multiple factors, path loss. But in this context, you have atmospheric turbulence. You may have uh, extra attenuation coming from clouds and molecular absorption. And you have the misalignment kind of factors. So let me focus on two aspects, atmospheric turbulence and misalignment, and show some of the work that we've been doing over the last few years on this topic. So, Atmospheric turbulence is a relatively simple concept. I mean, it's, it's very well studied. You know, recently we we have seen all these nice telescopes uh, uh, coming images, and that's actually one of one, one reason that, that they go to space to get to this to avoid the atmospheric turbulence. So you have basically this kind of uh, wind and convection uh, that create this uh, uh, different layer of atmosphere that are operating at different temperatures. And, and because of that, you can have different scale of turbulence, small scale turbulence, large scale turbulence. The small scale typically lead to what we call uh, uh, beam spreading, and the large scale turbulence lead to uh, beam wandering. And, and you know, and just to kind of uh, if you are in the lab and go and see what happens, basically this beam, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 spreading leads to some kind of blurring. If you're sending an image or like a beam, like Gaussian beam, you can some kind of this blur type of uh, result. And the beam wandering gives some kind of density. So basically, the, the beam is not any more fixed in a certain location. It moves around, and that kind of contributes to the misalignment that we are trying uh, to find. So it's typically characterized by the so-called circulation index, which is normalized variance of the strength of the signal at the receiver end. And uh, it essentially, it's one of the main reasons that makes the signal not stable. It's like the fading in a wireless, uh, wireless other context uh, that we need to kind of uh, mitigate. And uh, one classical model that uh, is being used, there's a log normal distribution, like we used for uh, uh, modeling the uh, you know, like RF uh, fading, it's used to model turbulence. But another popular and generic uh, kind of turbulence model is so-called gamma-gamma turbulence. What it is, it's a multiplication of two gamma random variables, one to model the large scale, one to model the, the small scale. And uh, you know, those of you who, who are kind of familiar with this kind of work, they know that uh, when you multiply to gamma, you end up with this kind of uh, a closed form expression uh, for distribution uh, of the gamma gamma. Uh, there is function of two parameters, alpha and beta, which themselves are function of the so-called right of bias, which is 
a measure of the strength of turbulence. So typically, this right of variance is function of the wind speed along the RMF, RMS wind speed along the path, and also its function of the altitude. If you talk about ground to space or ground to, 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 uh, to, 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 to air, uh, this sigma r is going to be function of that basic altitude. So you need to integrate over the whole uh, propagation path. So here, for simplicity, you know, that's kind of assuming that this right of bias is uh, the cn squared. And the cn squared, which is that refractive index, is found to the speed and, uh, and of altitude. But, you know, for fixed speed, speed uh, you know, that's how the right of bias. But one thing that uh, I want to be aware of, that this right of bias is basically uh, proportional to distance. In, in other words, the longer the distance, the larger is your uh, right of variance, the more turbulence you'll get. Okay, so that's a, a very important aspect that hopefully will help you understand some of the key results that I'm going to show later on. So you want to minimize the distance over which your uh, kind of signal go in order to avoid having turbulence. So that's kind of one thing I want to remember now, and, uh, and there are some other aspects that are really important. But bottom line, these are typically the kind of turbulence regime you operate over, which end up having a like a right of variance smaller than one, we call that a weak turbulence regime. If it's rough than one, you have moderate. If it's not weak than one, it's strong. And what it means is that if you have these uh, different values, so sigma is less than one, sigma is 1.6, sigma is 3.5, you end up with this three kind of illustration or pre realization of the gamma gamma distribution, where clearly when you have a strong turbulence, you have a heavy tail on this side, which means you have very bad performance. Okay, so you, uh, but, but you know, it's not under control, you, you have a dependent on the kind of chunk. Here. So, uh, now there are some interesting, there are multiple ways to mitigate the atmospheric turbulence. One interesting approach is adaptive optics. So, adaptive optics is this kind of a, a, a technique that has been developed initially for, again, for telescopes, for imaging, where basically you have a waveform control, it's sort of like a control system. Uh, where you have a waveform corrector, you have these mirrors, uh, this can be built through kind of the foam mirror or uh, basic liquid piece of display. It's an IRS kind of, uh, kind of if you will, uh, concept uh, that, that used a long time ago. Uh, it can be used at the uh, transmitter. So, uh, actually, I found an interesting YouTube video, it's like one minute, and I, I, I will show it to you because it takes some time. It illustrates very well for those who have never seen a lot of optics how it works. So, you, you can have a Gaussian beam on here where you are using some kind of uh, a structure beam. If you, you go to a turbulent environment, you get some distortion. If you have a, the right kind of mechanism, a control mechanism, you can clean up your signal and kind of base correct the beam. Uh, uh, this can be done in a, in a post compensation fashion, but you can do that in pre compensation if you have some kind of pilot or some kind of a, a reference point where you can kind of, uh, a kind of this, like do the deformation ahead of time. So you have a pre installed beam that goes through the turbulent environment, but at the end, you will see. A good deal. So let me show this video. It's just going to take one minute, but I think it's good to, to, to show. It's not mine actually, but I, I, I found it very illustrative and, and nice to kind of uh, show. So once let me escape from this. Uh... In this diagram of a point to point laser com link, eye safe laser light is transmitted at a distance through the atmosphere. Incoming light waves are disturbed by the effects of atmospheric scintillation caused by small-scale fluctuations in air density, usually related to a turbulent mixture of air with different temperatures. On the receive end of the link, the distorted wave fronts are corrected in real time through a high-order closed-loop control system consisting of a wavefront sensor, control algorithm, and a deformable mirror. It's these rapid, simultaneous correction capabilities nested in the A-Optics bi-directional laser comm terminals that keep the light waves plain, returning the transmitted light energy into the receiving aperture coupled to the fiber. With the inbound correction information coming over the link, it can then apply that same correction to the transmit beam. This pre-correction benefit focuses the outgoing beam back through the atmosphere delivering maximum power to the end terminal aperture. Okay, so this was, I mean, I, I felt it was a very good video illustrating the concept of that optics in a pre-compensation, post-compensation fashion. So uh, uh, let me go back to the, uh, you know, this mode, right? So, uh, you know, uh, so 
why I'm showing that? Because actually, in one of our recent papers, we were able to model, I think, one of the first to model that, that we were able to kind of uh, take into advantage of some of the models we put together and kind of derive and talk from the performance of the system that can benefit from other optics. There's not much work from a communication engine perspective, quite a bit of work from optics, components, on other topics, but we try to learn from that kind of uh, community and model it using kind of performance analysis tools and we were able to analyze our probability using some other optics and I will show you some results as we move forward. Okay, so let me now, uh, this was again more of a technical introduction about three phase optics. Let me now uh, kind of give you maybe some of our uh, results. So here is, uh, you know, what I'm trying to kind of present in this slide is an illustration of what is random in the budget plane. So there is the path loss and the kind of attenuation to the clouds that can be viewed as deterministic given a certain weather environment. What is done at any given time is the atmospheric turbulence, IA, and the pointing errors. So let's talk to the pointing error of the beta line. So ideally, this is your detector. So ideally, the beam footprint should be perfectly aligned, and the center of the beam should be exactly at the center of the detector. The reality is this beam is going to be dancing around because of beam wandering, because of all kinds of vibrations, and you're going to catch only a fraction of basically the power coming from the beam. So this kind of fraction has been quantified with the class state by Pi Hano, which showing that essentially IP is related to the equivalent beam waste of the uh, laser beam and R, which is a magnitude of this vibration. Now, so R is like for a snapshot. Okay? Now in practice, the model that is being used is that you assume that the vibration in the horizontal domain that is Gaussian and vibration is in the vertical domain that's also Gaussian. So R being the magnitude of square x squared plus y squared, of course, you know, if you assume that this vibration is zero mean, same variance, R is going to follow a distribution. And thus, let's say the classical model has been used in so many papers to kind of quantify the impact of these alignment. But in reality, you you may have actually quite a bit of other scenarios. In other words, you may end up having, and I'll show that later on, for example, non-zero beam towards the bore side. You can have different kind of vibrations and multiply that in our work, especially for space and air application, where you may have more vibration because of wind in the horizontal domain than basically in the vertical domain, which means that the really assumption is not good. What when you when you, for example, have a kind of a, the statistics of scope x squared plus y squared where x and y are both Gaussian and correlated, uh, both let's say have zero mean, but they have different variance. The statistics is known as a hybrid hold distribution. It has a, it does have a gross form, it's like an empty representation, and we did use that actually in our analysis. So there are interesting scenarios. But uh, uh, beyond the fact that you may end up having residual errors, what we're trying to do, we want to minimize uh, this kind of misalignment. Okay? And uh, the classical way of Minimizing the minimize line is to, de to deploy a so called PAT algorithm. So, what is PAT? PAT stands for positioning, acquisition, and tracking. So, let's say, for example, show an acquisition mechanism. So, let's assume you are on the ground and trying to kind of uh, point to a satellite physically. So, step number one is to have a guess of the position of your satellite. So, GPS, like it's a hub, let's say, you will use GPS to try to have an idea where the hub is. And that could be uh, there has been some kind of interesting work done by the people in photonics, experimental work on how should you kind of scan the space to be able to lock on the signal. And actually, experimentally, they showed that one good way to do things is through spiral. Actually, we, we try different approach. We try what we call shotgun approach. You know, you take a space and just try randomly. A spiral, spiral or going through different paths. But actually, spiral that happens to be indeed the best. Why? Because uh, the underlying Gaussian error uh, horizontally and vertically can can kind of go well uh, with the probability that most of you uh, you have a high probability of being uh, locking on the signal very close to the center. So the way it goes, you basically go around. So you have a beam, you flash the beam, you see to detect the signal. If not, you can keep moving around until you kind of are beyond a certain limit, three times the variance, let's say, of the of the vibrations, and then you go back. What 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 what, what can happen actually? It may happen that actually. Although the signal, let's say, actually the, the true location of the satellite is here, but basically it's not sensitive enough, so you have a misdetection. 
So basically, you, you kind of go through the satellite, but you're not able to detect it's there, so which means you have to go through another one. So we're able to quantify the total accretion time. So it is equal to the scan time, which is the total time needed to go through the whole spiral, times x, which is the number of five failure times, which is geometric and variables, plus TD, which is the dwell time. That's basically the time it takes to kind of shine the beam and wait a little bit to see if you're locked to a signal. Okay? Plus W, which is the fraction of time to the last successful attempt, which is, you know, last time when you were successful, you are not going through the whole spiral in the fraction of it. It turns out that the distribution of, uh, of this uh, W is an exponential and variable, again, due to the fact that uh, you have a rating uh, for the vibration, so when you derive the result, you end up with an exponential. So, all in all, the statistics of this equation time is the sum of the discrete geometric and variable and the continuous exponential and variable. And they are independent. You can derive in close form the, the, the overall statistics of TU. You can obtain the complementary CDF, which is a kind of the desired metric, which is basically the probability that your acquisition time exceeds a certain, let's say, deadline. So you have a deadline to lock on your signal, and this deadline is set as gamma, and you can derive in close form as far as parameters. And what we showed in our results is basically, uh, actually, we did like with the multi kind of, uh, let's say, with an array of detectors, we show that uh, the, the large number of uh, detectors, the better is your, of course, uh, 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 kind of complementary CDF, which, uh, which makes sense. But I think what is uh, interesting to notice here is that uh, if you change the beam of your laser, that's something under your control, right? So because if you want to minimize, in your mind, if you want to minimize the misalignment, you want to open the beam, right? But when you open the beam, you lose in sensitivity. Right? So in other words, what, what this kind of figure illustrates is, is kind of uh, what intuitively you, you, you think uh, can happen. So as you, you, you open the beam, you start improving because the beam is big, so you can go quickly through the whole spiral, right? But at some point, if the beam becomes too big, then basically your sensitivity becomes not as good as you wish to be. So you go through the whole, I mean, you will miss basically the satellite, although it's there. So you have more misdetection. So there's a nice speed spot here where you can optimize the beam radius to minimize your basically complementary CDF. So now, regardless of any path algorithm, and that's one example of many algorithms that are out there, and many more sophisticated, even typical control and the community can work on these path algorithms, you will end up always with some residual errors. And again, the way we run residual errors is by having a model for this R that is typically the, the, the magnitude of vibration that are Gaussian in the X domain and the Gaussian Y domain. Uh, in our model that I will be explaining later on, we assume that the vibration are Gaussian with the zero mean on the X domain, uh, Gaussian the, the zero mean in the, the Y domain, but we assume that we have imbalance, which means we tolerate the fact that uh, you may have more wind uh, in one dimension that make the, 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 like say the halves vibrate more in one dimension which is the horizontal dimension and vertical dimension. And again, in that case, R will follow what we call a hoyt dipole distribution. Now, just to make a long story short, what we're able to analyze is you take a gamma-gamma distribution, you take this kind of pointing error which is subject to hoyt, you put everything together, and those of you who are kind of interested in these kind of problems end up with a triple entity for arch probability. And uh, fortunately enough, Recently, with a good collaborator, Yalshin Yata, we were able to find some close form expression for these house problems. So, if you assume imbalanced vibrations, you get this integral form, which is finite plane integral form for the G function. Uh, if you assume balanced vibrations, it means you assume that the special case of uh, the, 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 let's say, the, the variance of the vibration, the x domain, are the same as the, the y domain, you get a true close form, uh, basically, does involve any integral. Uh, and then even for log normal, which tends to be, as, as those of you who are very kind of uh, familiar with this kind of problem, log normal is the, the most tedious uh, distribution to deal with. We're able to get a finite range integral for imbalanced case and a full close form in terms of special function. I mean, the, I mean of course, it's a, it's complicated expression, I mean, like length expression, but it involves, you know, earth complementary log and one F1 function, and it's uh, easy to compute. It's not a, so this expression that, you know, takes a lot of time to compute. Uh, so this is for the imbalanced case. Uh, I don't want to do have another slide for the balanced case, but in the balanced case, you can get rid of this integral and you can get the true close form. So why I show that those because uh, those of you I know who, 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 who like these performance kind of problems, 
you know, uh, initially when you look at this kind of strict antidote, you never think that this can be done in post one but in this particular case, we were lucky and we were able to get for both post one and gamma gamma some interesting post one expressions. Now, these are going to be useful for the next work. So, let me now show these results and try to link with what I talked about earlier. So, here is a single link, okay? Ultra big as social altitude. So, here we are looking at particular HAPS, uh, ground to HAPS type of uh, performance, and we have three scenarios. We look at uplink, ground to HAPS, downlink, HAPS to ground, and horizontal. So, horizontal is a very interesting actually application because typically you want to see HAPS to HAPS type of transmission. You can create your shared network in the stratosphere, right? So what happens here is the worst is the uplink. And, and that's known, that uplink is the worst kind of performance because you hit turbulence. One thing you have to understand, or to, and to, I mean, those who know the topic, turbulence is function of distance, and turbulence is stronger in the lower atmosphere. The higher you go, the lower turbulence. Beyond 20 kilometers, pretty much there is no turbulence. Okay? And that's why the uplink is going to be hit first with the turbulence, the signal gets distorted very quickly, and typically you have the worst performance, and that's seen here. Downlink, slightly better. Horizontal link is much better, especially at high altitude, because if you are operating at 20 kilometers, there is no turbulence. Okay? Now, what you show here is we have that office. As I told you, this paper was one of the first, at least I'll commit to my best knowledge, that we're introducing what has been done in the adapt optics photonics community, and we try to show the gains that adapt optics bring. Especially the uplink is quite a bit of uh, gain. You see this blue curve and this blue uh, uh, with the dark curve. We have this quite a bit of interesting gain from our adapt optics or correction by adapt optics. You can get correction also for downlink, and similarly you can get the uh, improvement for the Especially, of course, the lower attitude, at high attitude, anyway, the performance is already very good. Now, I will conclude in the last 10 minutes or so my, uh, my talk by explaining how we can integrate FSO with a, a hybrid, let's say, integrated space, ground, sorry, say space, air, ground, as I talked to you in the beginning. So, this is the model we started with. I told you. This nice potential of using FSO as a feeder link. But obviously, FSO will have to deal with turbulence. And typically, when you have FSO, you have always a backup RF. Okay? Now, last year, there was a paper actually by uh, some colleagues in IIT, I'm not sure which IIT exactly, and Singapore, that proposed this kind of architecture. So, the architecture they proposed is they use a HAPS as relay. And the idea, and we are focusing here on uplink. The idea is most of the problems are coming in the lower atmosphere from 0 to kilometers. So you put the hash as relay in order to, click, to clean the signal in a decode and forward fashion. So basically, the hubs can send the better version of the signal to the satellite you know, at 36,000 kilometers. So this is just 20 kilometers, and this is where most of the turbulence is happening and most of the problems are happening. You clean the signal and basically send the satellite. And actually, they showed with that that they can get some 4 dB type of gains. Now, actually, we looked at this problem in a little bit more detail, and we liked the idea, and probably it may not the first or only paper of this kind of talking about that, but you know, we just took that as, as, a, as our starting point. And the question we asked ourselves how should we position this house? So, the paper, you know, intuitively or logically, they put the house midway or along the path between the optical equations and satellite. But the question, is it the optimal location for the hubs? And turns out, actually, it's not. For the very simple reason I talked to you about earlier, that turbulence is function of distance, and most turbulence is happening here. So it turns out, to make a long story short, that the optimal location for the hubs is, regardless of the fact that we are going to a longer distance here than here, is that basically when the hubs is really always on the top of the optical gateway station. So thanks to our analytical result I showed earlier, what we're, so this is kind of the classical system and the consideration. We have a ground station with the satellite. We can have a direct link. We can have a relay link. And the question, where should we put the hubs? OK? So we have, let's look at the hubs. Uh, let's look at the performance of this uh, relayed link as function of this zenith angle. And uh, what, what we have shown, actually, if you look at this alpha and beta parameter I showed earlier, 
that first of all, the alpha and beta parameter from half satellite are very high. And by the way, when, when they are high, it means there is a small amount of fading, which means there is no scintillation, which is good. But then, when you look at these two lower curves, alpha and beta, the, the blue is like the kind of reference state I talked about that was published last year. The alpha and beta in their own design, of course, as an angle increases, alpha and beta degrades quite a bit. And that's, that's expected because you are going to go through a longer path and we have more turbulence, so alpha and beta is going to degrade. Whereas with our proposed design, actually alpha and beta remain always constant because regardless of where, uh, uh, whether what the zenith angle is, you are always above essentially the, uh, uh, the, the ground station. And this is if you step in this, uh, so this is a good advantage of the new result we were able to uh, calculate, like on pointing errors. And, uh, uh, here we keep a good home distribution. So you see, here you assume that basically, uh, yeah, here you assume that the zenith angle is 50 degrees. Like basically, if you put the halves uh, uh, along the path of ground space, that's the worst performance. And as the zenith angle decreases, when it becomes zero, which means the halves is exactly on the top of the ground station, you get the best performance. Okay, and uh, so you know, we just can get, keep going forward. You can have some diversity because you know, uh, although you are trying to you, you can improve uh, with this optimal positioning of the hubs, the FSO link, but still, uh, you know, you, you can uh, discharge to an outage, so you need to have a backup link to which we assume is RF. So, with that, I think I'm running out of time here. We showed like uh, the kind of performance we can get. So, just to kind of uh, show, this is basically. A very simple hybrid RF FSO system. You know, this is the paper I talked about earlier when they, they, they have a relay system where they can get a bit of a gain, but in this case, the position of the half is not optimized. Uh, here we can look at the extreme case, the zenith angle is, is, is large, and if you optimize your half location, you can get maybe a 19 dB gain, or if you mean a, a 15 gain compared to non optimized half location. If you back up this uh, FSO dead link to the RF, you can get some 2 dB extra gain. So, you know, so all in all, you can get great gain of probability, you can get the same type of gains in average probability of errors, all this is out there also completely analytically. But let me uh, conclude this by this ultimate system that we are proposing. And why do you look at this ultimate system? Because at the end of the day, yes, RF is good as a backup, but RF comes at a certain cost. The cost that RF comes with is you lose in terms of data rate, right? Because FL, I mean, the, the beauty of RF connectivity, of RF backup, it, it, it basically allows you to maintain connectivity, but at a sometime much lower data rates. So ideally, you want to stay on FSO link as much as possible. So our ultimate design is a design where basically you start with the relay FSO link. If it fails, you try to go to another FSO link, so as an extra diversity link, and if all, both fails, you switch to an RF link. So it's a three order, four or three four, or diversity systems. And obviously, this will be more expensive, but it will give you the best performance. And we show that ideally, at closing angle, our so called integrated subcom system with this three level diversity give you a certain uh, gain or clearly an advantage. But as the angle increases, because the FSO link will be starts to high turbulence, the backup FSO link, if you will, uh, you know, kind of not beneficial anymore. But all in all, uh, what this curve illustrates is this ultimate system, what it gives you, it gives you basically the best probability of RF link usage in the sense that it's the lowest. Because you want the use of your RF link to be the lowest, you want to maintain as much as possible connectivity on FSO because that's the connectivity that gives you the highest fidelity of speed. So with our, uh, with our scheme, or the scheme, we have this kind of uh, red type of uh, probability of uh, usage. With our uh, uh, ultimate so-called scheme, we get uh, uh, this extra uh, gain from a uh, lowering the probability of unit usage. Again, we lose that gain as the angle increases because when the angle becomes huge, uh, uh, FSO link, it will become to a certain extent not very large. So, with that, I would like uh, to thank you for your attention. I think I am right on time here, and uh, I would be happy uh, to take uh, some questions.
uh, on this topic. Thank you for this uh, exciting talk. Uh, open now for questions. Yes, Professor. This is in the capacity of optical channels. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, some of the work by Heinovich, I guess, and by uh, Steve Heinovich and Shishank in Toronto, right? Yes, and actually, I shouldn't have. Oh, what's that thing? So, like, a count scintillation effect? Or like... Okay, okay. okay. Yes, yes, which is. I see. So, and you take into account the fact that because the classical work on information theory, indeed, a little bit is one of my fault. Look, is uh, what makes it a little bit different is that you need to, to take into account the positivity aspect of the signal. So, basically, if you assume I am the of detection. So, I'm not sure if the, uh, this is what you're referring to or if something gets beyond that. Maybe I'm not aware of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There, there would be. Yeah. yeah. Now, of course, information theory always brings a lot of interesting uh, aspects. Definitely, I'll be happy to, to, to look at this paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. It was a very nice talk. So, uh, may I understand the superior intuition behind having the gamma gamma model to be the valid model in the context of physical based communication? Uh, it has some justification for why this. Have so, okay. Like this is there is no correct or wrong model, right? Model is 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 is, 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 is can you use a model to basically for two reasons, in my view. So, of um, what make a model say interesting or uh, or, or, uh, or you want to adopt it for two reasons. Number one should be accurate enough. And accurate enough can have some physical kind of interpretation, and it can be validated by experimental results. So the physical interpretation, as I told you earlier, turbulence often when you go to the turbulence literature is scale is kind of divided two scale of, of turbulence. Like in, in when you talk about RF engineering, like small scale turbulence, I mean that's uh, like fading and shadowing, right? So there are these two phenomena, and typically we model uh, uh, like small scale fading or multipath by ray or variation and shadowing by log model. Same thing when you talk about scintillation and turbulence, there is two scale of turbulence, and every scale is more by gamma distribution. And then basically, because they're multi ticket, you end up with a gamma gamma with two different parameters. So, another model that you can use and is being used is a log normal variation. So, basically, large scale turbulence are log normal uh, because they are due to kind of obstruction of the beam, and the kind of beam spreading is kind of variation. And then you have a so called log normal variation model. but it's the, so reason number one is accuracy and physical interpretation, but reason number two is analytic tractability. And the gamma gamma has its beautiful kind of characteristics because origin from gamma and set origin from Gaussians. Typically, you end up being able to solve things in two form. Not always guaranteed, and I showed here actually no longer able to solve in two form. But the fact that you use a gamma gamma that by itself as a two form expression allows you, from a communication theory perspective, to carry the data. Okay, so I hope I answered your questions. I'm not saying this is the best. And by the way, there are so many other models. There's exponential rebuild, the Malaga distribution, the inverse Gaussian. So, you know, you name it. I mean, I can give you 10 models of uh, turbulence uh, channels, you know. But gamma gamma tend to be a very popular model for its tractability and relatively accuracy over a wide range of turbulence. Yeah. Sheikh. Yes. Yeah, sure. So I just wanted to ask you uh, the topic of UVC communications where it does not require any plastic versions. Which, which one? UVC communication. I'm covering communication. Oh, UV. Okay, yeah. Where it does not require plastic versions. 
Uh, I mean, to be honest, this UV, so you, I mean, what she has talked about is the UV communication, ultraviolet communication. So when I, just to make sure that everyone is kind of on the same page. So when you talk about optical wireless, there is a near infrared, which is free space optics, the visible part, which is VLC or Wi Fi. And then if you go push the envelope further, you reach the UV part. So the UV part is what I would call really the next frontier. Very few papers and very few research groups are working on that. Now, typically the main challenge is the hardware. The hardware tends to be cumbersome and so on. Now, the main advantage is, I talk about, it's not misalignment, it's that you can bypass the non line of sight. In other words, FSO and VLC, you need to have a line of sight to be transmitted and receiver. As you know, in RF, one of the beauty of RF engineering is that basically, you know, we can bypass because the wave can kind of go through walls and so on, especially at low frequencies. In FSO and VLC, if you don't have a line of sight, you can have a communication. With UV algo, you can have hay, the building on your way, but the thing can bounce to the iron sphere. So basically, you can bypass, or you can kind of bypass this line of sight constraint. But again, it's very much science fiction. Very few research groups, uh, hardware problems, help. I mean, also, if you want to have like, a, you know, like UV while like walking around. So it's still, I mean, just like research that is at the early kind of stage of investigation. Few groups are working on that. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay, okay, very good question. So for question number one, what we looked at is only the optimal location horizontal. We don't look at the optimal height because the height typically is dictated by, the, I mean, these uh, hubs, they will be operating at roughly 20 kilometer altitude. Okay, so I'm not talking about UA, UAV or I'm talking about really hubs in the stratosphere. So now, uh, uh, maybe the, the higher it is, the better it is, but of course you don't want to go very high because maybe your, your budget link will not be good enough. So my, my guess, although that may be a good study, is to put the hubs uh, exactly at the altitude where turbulence or atmospheric turbulence become weak. Uh, I mean, or decrease so that you can clean up the signal and re-forward, okay? But our focus was basically where to place the haps horizontally, okay? And actually, beyond that, if you think about it from a like an architect network architecture perspective, your vision can be uh, basically a network of haps interconnected with each other. So you create a cellular network in the stratosphere with macro cells. So you see what I'm trying to envision. And you need to have this connectivity between hubs that can be done through FSO, and then the hubs can act as an umbrella uh, uh, coverage area within 200 kilometer radius. So you create basically again a cellular network, but instead of the ground, but on the stratosphere. Okay, and, and, and with that, the good the, the news is the good news is that uh, you, you can put basically your hubs just on the top of your optic gateway station. Satellite can be anywhere, it doesn't matter, because you know that the, the most of the tumors are happening here, and that's now, effect of the Doppler, it's not something, that's a good question, actually, and that's kind of, uh, I have not seen much work on the effect of Doppler on um, optical wireless communication, you know? That's a good uh, question. Yeah, I have not seen work on that. I mean, maybe they, they have, the people look at, uh, maybe, but uh, when people look at high speed, uh, uh, I mean, when people, because people look at the question of how to connect to high speed moving, uh, for example, airplane, okay? They focus more not on the Doppler, but how can I uh, keep track of, of the airplane from an FSO alignment perspective? Okay, this is most of the challenge people look at, but they don't look at Doppler. I mean, or maybe I pay attention to this problem. Thank you for the two very good questions. Yes, please. Sorry, what? The? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So it's about the uh, sensitization that you mentioned. Yes. So you showed the uh, method. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is a, it's a, it's a, it's a very rich literature. A lot of optics is really. I mean, as I just told you, this uh, we just kind of borrowed. I mean, really, we did a, to be honest, no contribution from our side from a signal processing perspective. 
We just looked at the model. We were able to solve the integrals for the, how to get the closed format fifth variety of variance, assuming the certain model of adaptive optics. But it's a very rich literature, not from a communication paper, but more from imaging. A lot of the work that has been done on this is coming from the imaging uh, community, astronomy, and then so on. Okay, so signal processing uh, is uh, there is some very rich uh, uh, kind of work on that. I'm not familiar with all the work. We just use a, one particular model of deformed models that allowed us to basically compute the right of variance under certain other optics type of uh, techniques. But I, I'm not. I cannot claim I know, I'm aware of all the other optics techniques that are out there. You, you are trying to basically, uh, so what, 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 what my understanding, again, uh, from a signal processing perspective, is you, you send kind of a pilot signal, and you see how that pilot signal gets distorted, and uh, there is like a, this kind of closed loop that allow you to use some either crystal liquid type of uh, surface or deformable mirrors to basically clean up, to kind of recalibrate that particular pilot signal, and they use the same kind of deformation to clean up the signal that goes through the same propagation path. Yeah, that, that's the alignment problem. So basically, this is where basically you need to, to make sure. So there, there is a kind of, a, I, I, I want to see it as the blurring aspect, the dancing aspect. So the blurring you can clean with adaptive optics. The dancing aspect, part of it is, is uh, uh, can be fixed by this position acquisition tracking, where basically you need to, to find where the signal is at any given time and lock to it and keep tracking it. And uh, again, a lot of work has been, uh, in my case, what I focus on, and people here maybe in the audience can uh, uh, some, I mean, understand what I'm talking about, I'm looking at more the performance analysis, which means once a path algorithm is put in place and there are some residual errors, and I know the status of residual errors, what are the performance? But how this can be done, there is a rich literature from a more control. Actually, I have a colleague, Marian, Dr. Mariam Lalek, in, in my department. She, she has done a lot of good work on control algorithm for the path, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yes. The what? The? The model of the Uh, is, is, for, no, I mean, in our model here is like uh, there is like a model that, that depends on the order of the there is like the order of a polynomial basically, and the higher the order of polynomial, the more accuracy you get. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's some polynomial correction. I forgot the name Z. Uh, I have to remember the like. No, it's, it's the, uh, I have the name escaped me now, but there is a name for a polynomial, and the higher the order of polynomial, uh, you know, the more complex it gets, but the better is the correction. But there is also, as you know, and all of us are living in this time where AI is everywhere. So there is also some work where AI is being used to correct uh, for turbulence. Okay, so you know, you using AI type algorithm, like you learn the by by yeah. by, by, by trial and error kind of. Okay. Yeah. So since we are out of time, so let me just close this section here. Let me please.